Well, if you get your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to John 6. We're going to continue through this. Um, we may depart a little bit next week and maybe the week after. Um, but today we're going, to, we're going to keep going on this. We've been talking about God's provision for the bread of life. And last week we continued to talk about this. We, we, we looked at that God's will must become our will. Or our inadequacies will leave us in a state of no victory, no joy, oops, and only self-centered endeavors. Amen? If we don't get to the point where we say, not my will, but your will be done, this is what we, we find. And so today, as I begin to, to look at this, um, I, I think some of the issues that we have in the church, and I'm using church here universally, not specifically this church, but church univers uh, universally, I think one of the issues that we have is that we try to follow Jesus on a one-dimensional understanding. Now let me explain this, okay? Because I think um, either, either we, we, we have the physical understanding, which means I've got to work for my salvation. It's all up to me, okay? So when I say physical understanding or the physical dimension today, that's what I'm meaning. It's like, I've got to do it all. And we've all been there, haven't we? You know, we've all been there. So I've got to do it all. So that's one. Or we get stuck in the other dimension, which is the spiritual dimension, which means that I don't got to do anything. Right? And we would all like to be stuck there, amen? I mean, it's the easiest way to be, right? If I don't have to be, do anything, then I'm okay. So, so there's these two dimensions. And I think what happens is, is that we get stuck, okay, in one of these dimensions. You following me so far? Yeah. So what I want to talk about today is living a life two-dimensionally. Where the physical and the spiritual act as one. Now, as we begin to understand this, we're going to use a passage of scripture uh, that is, is, is used a lot for the communion that we're going to take today. Okay? And so what I want to do, though, is I want to I really just kind of look at this a little bit different. You see, what's been going on in the scripture has really been one-dimensional in, in one aspect. is that the people were hungry and Jesus filled their bellies. That's pretty physical. The, the, um, the disciples were on a boat and they got scared in a physical storm to the point that they didn't even remember that Jesus said, I'll meet you on the other side. That was completely physical, right? Until Jesus came walking on the water and they thought he was a ghost. Okay? Then we get a little spiritual, right? So, anyway, but we, we have these things. Okay? And, and that's really what has been going on. You see, what the people were looking for in this time was a physical king. The whole understanding was, was one-dimensional. They wanted a king that would come in and free them from the bonds of the Roman Empire. That's what they wanted. And guess what? I don't think that want is wrong. <laughs> You know, when we're under the boot of somebody, you know what, it's okay to want some freedom, amen? And, and, it, and it's okay, but this is where they were stuck, and I think we, oh boy, we in America have to be really careful that we don't get this way. We just want Jesus to come back to free us from the boot of our enslavers. That's not it, the whole point. But so many of us get so wrapped up in this. You see, they wanted a physical king. They really didn't want a Messiah. There, there's a difference. You see, a king is there to free him from physical, but the Messiah was come to set up a kingdom, yes, but he did it in a different way. He was coming to do, to set this thing up in a different way. You see, Jesus can bring in a spiritual kingdom. But with the spiritual kingdom, I believe there has to be a huge impact on our physical life. We want to be rescued from the physical storms of life, but at some point, we have to understand that the physical must change. I mean, the spiritual must change our physical. And we're going to keep going on this. So, I, I, I'm going to read some scripture, and then I'm going to tell you a story that's not anywhere near the scripture. And then we're going to go some farther in, and then we'll come back at the end, and I'll bring it all together, okay? So, let's, let's read. Uh, we're in 6. We're going to start in 47. We're going to read to 59. It says, I assure you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. 
This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of this world is my flesh. At that, the Jews grumbled among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourself. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Because of the flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. This is the one who eats my flesh and drinks of my blood, lives in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So, or because of the Father. So the ones who feed on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the man that your fathers ate, and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum. Now, I want to tell you a story. The story is found in 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles. And it's about David. And it's probably, to me, it's a very moving story about David, and, and it's probably a forgotten story about David. Well, see, what was going on at this time was there was this group of people called the Philistines, and they had taken over Bethlehem, the city of David. This is where David was from. And in our Christmas season, we understand Bethlehem, do we not? Okay, this is the one where Joseph and Mary had to go because they were of the line and lineage of David, and so they had to come and they had to sign the paper and pay their taxes, and they had to go back to their hometown. This is the same place. So David grew up in this town. This is his hometown, right? Well, the Philistines had taken over. Now, this is the time where, where David and his mighty men ruled. And if you want to hear some awesome stories, man, you've got to read that part of the Bible. It's pretty cool. I mean, you, you think we have modern-day superheroes? Man, nothing compares to David and his mighty men. I'm going to tell you one of those stories. You see, in a conversation taking place, probably I see in, in the tent of David lying, lying around and just kind of relaxing. And David says, man, I am thirsty. Now, at that point, any one of his mighty men would jump up because this is David, right? And God himself to drink. But he doesn't just say, I'm thirsty. He goes, man, I would love a drink from the well of Bethlehem, his hometown. Problem, that city was run by the Philistines at this point. And, and it, they had their army encamped, and it was, it was big, right? Well, after this point, three of his mighty men got up together, uh, you know, and I kind of what I think has happened is like one had to go to the restroom and... One had to go check something else, and they got together on the outside and said, Hey, let's do something really cool for King David. Let's go get him that water from Bethlehem. So they all gathered together, and they got their men, and they went on, and they fought the Philistines. And it says in the scripture that they fought all the way to the well, they got the water, and they got on back. And they came, I mean, that's an awesome story, right? And, and the, the thing that I really like about the story, too, is, man, it showed the honor that David had. And his men loved David. Right? And so they did this for him, right? They bring him back, and you would think that David was like, oh, finally, you know, 48 ounces of good water, you know. I live in Fulton. When I come to get well water, I know what he felt like. Well water or Fulton water? I want well water. <laughs> That's just all there is to it, right? And so I'm sitting here going, okay, this is awesome. Until I read what David does. <clears throat> David takes this water. He goes, how can I drink this? This is the blood of the men who lost their lives getting me this water. And he poured it out on the ground. And I'm his friends, I'm like, you just did not do that. <laughs> really? That's what you did? But he said, this is the blood that was poured out for these men getting this. And I can't drink it because if I drink it, I will be drinking the blood of those men. Now, can you park that in the back of your head? Can you park that in the back of your head? Let's go back to John. As we look at this, John starts out with a phrase, and in the whole minute it says, I assure you. Some of your scriptures will say, verily, verily. Good translation is, amen, amen. It means truly, truly. When Jesus says that, y'all, man, stop, turn off the radio, get in your little private place, and really look at what Jesus is saying. Because when he says, Truly, truly, or verily, verily, or amen, amen, it is something important and you need to get it. It's something deep. He starts this. He says, I assure you, anyone who believes 
has eternal life. Now, that sounds all well and good, right? But he goes on to explain what he says. I am the bread of life. So he's saying, truly, truly, you've got to believe what I'm about to say in order for you to have eternal life. Okay? And so then he goes on, he says, I'm the bread of life. And then he begins to compare some things. He says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Now when he says that, we in this body of Christ, because I talk about the Exodus story quite a bit, okay, we should understand when it says they ate manna, we automatically go to the Exodus story, correct? Well, so did their people. So did what he was saying to them. They went there. He goes, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Now it's interesting because I look up the word ate and it is estheo in the Greek. And it is a physical eat, to take something in. But towards the end of the definitions, you can also say this, that it is also to work for one's bread that you are going to eat, or to earn a living. Interesting, isn't it? So, we're not talking about, now listen to this, we're talking about a physical thing, right? Those who ate that manna from heaven, they died. And we know the story. So here the writer, John is trying to say, look, what I want you to do is I want you to understand. <coughs> He's pulling us into the understanding, a two-dimensional understanding of, of what Jesus is trying to say. But at the same time, he's also reminding us of what this book is about, which is about new creation, resurrection. And now we're going to get into the Exodus. And what I really want to talk to you about is what I'm going to name new Exodus. Do you know that we all have a point in our life that we need a new Exodus? I want you to know, I have been under bondage, and I've been set free from, amen? But it doesn't mean tomorrow that the enemy won't come in and man, knock my legs out, and I get stuck under. How many have been there? We've gone from bondage to bondage to bondage. Man, we need a new exodus. And I think it's okay to say we need a new exodus every day. You know? And, and so he's trying to get us to this point. So he's, he's making this comparison. So he says, this bread... That comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat it and not die. He says, I am the bread of life. Now I've come down from heaven. And if you eat of this bread himself, you will not die. Now, things get a little shaky. Especially in the hearts and minds of his people at the most, his followers. His Talmudim. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Now, you need to understand the phrase that came down from heaven is very, very important. This is what gives the authority to Jesus to preach what he's preaching. That was a phrase that everybody would do. He is saying that Elohim, God, is giving me the authority to say these words. And can I say to you that you have been given that same authority to preach the word of God, to speak the word of God? You have been given that same authority. Elohim gives you that authority. So when you're thinking about it, just remember that you have been given the bread that has come down from heaven. If you have Jesus, you've been given the bread, and now you've been given the authority because it comes down from heaven. I don't know about you, but that's pretty awesome. So he says, the bread that I will give for life of this world is my flesh. Now he says it straight out. He says, and the bread that I'm talking about is my flesh. By the way, that's physical. Jesus didn't go to the cross in the spiritual. He went physically. That's a big deal. Because you know the phrase, it is finished after that, wouldn't mean anything if it was just a spiritual kind of thing. Because he became the lamb that was slain for my sins. Once and for all. Past, present, and future. I have the opportunity to have a relationship with God because the lamb that was slain and his blood spilled. So, so when we look at this, we see this. Now at this point, you've got to understand the Jewish people who follow kosher law, who follow the law, are kind of freaking out here at the moment. Because if we just took this completely physical... We just learned that we need to be a cannibal and eat of flesh. That goes against the law. And it goes, I mean, any kosher laws, you have to understand, 
they went out of their way so that they wouldn't eat blood or drink blood. I mean, or eat flesh that wasn't cooked. I mean, the laws, they went through. And so now, all of a sudden, <laughs> Jesus is making this statement. And really what he's done is he's punched a hole in their worldview. And they, they don't know what to do with it. Has that ever happened to you? Where God allows something in your life or in our culture or in our nation that punches a hole in your worldview to the point that you complain? Or, or maybe to a point of which, because I know, when you sit under some, a teaching that is a hard teaching, and we're going to hear this, that's a hard teaching, and it punches a hole through your worldview, you tend to want to forget about what you just heard. Especially if you've been taught something your whole life, and now something all of a sudden is like, just punched a hole in it. Let's just look at it from a cultural standpoint, okay? Our culture is a self-centered, relative culture. Everything's about us, individually, and there's no absolute truth. That is our world, that is our culture. And if you don't think that's our culture, wake up. Because that's what it's about. It's so funny because when the Bible talks about idols and all these things, we think the Bible isn't relevant. I'm telling you, I read in the Old Testament, and I'm like, oh my goodness, we are back where we were. We're no different than, than what Israel did when they wanted to go after other gods. We've done it. Our gods are a little different. They may not be Zeus and Apollo and, and, and all those others. Our gods are football stars, basketball stars, money, cars, all these things, political figures. We have raised so many idols above God in our nation that, that that's what people think. It's all about me, babe, and there's no absolute truth, so I can get away with whatever I want. When we begin to talk about Jesus, what we're doing is what Jesus did in this passage, and we punch a hole into the worldview, and we say, no, it is not about you. It has never been about you. It is about God. It is about Jesus. It is about the Holy Spirit. If that's what it is. And we cause people to go, what? It's almost kind of like the same. Like we're telling them we've got to do this ridiculous thing of eating somebody. You know? And it gets worse than that. I mean, these people are sitting there going, how can we do this? It wasn't like, how in the, is it really possible? It was a spiritual how. You see where the physical now is becoming conflict with the spiritual? How do we do this? I mean, this goes against everything. So in verse 53, Jesus says, So then I assure you, he's, again, there it is, verily, verily, truly, truly, amen, amen. He says this again. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, we've talked about that, he takes it one step further now and says, and drink his blood. Whoa! At this point, he's already lost half the congregation, okay? Alright, and, and, and I get that. I've said some stuff from here before, and I, and I know Check off, check out. I'm not listening anymore. La, 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 la. I, I know it happens, okay? So I, mean, I, I kind of get what Jesus is at at the moment. And, but he says this. But he says, if you don't do this, this is what he says, listen to this. If you don't do this, eat his flesh, drink his blood, then you don't have life in you. Okay, physically, bread, we know, is used for the sustaining of life. Right? We know scientifically, physically, that blood, if it does not flow through our body, we die. <laughs> right? So I see the physical. Right? But sometimes it's hard to see the spiritual. See, this is when we get hooked up. Well, I understand what he's saying here. If we put this in a, in a, a roundabout... <laughs> You know, he's talking in, in allegory and this kind of stuff. I get that, okay, so I see that. But we get caught up because here's the thing. In that culture, bread, that was the sustaining of life. When you ate or digested something and it went down into the stomach, they believed the stomach was the center of the being. Right? It's funny because then centuries later we thought the heart was the center of the being. But now we realize scientifically that when the Bible talks about the heart of man, 
talking about the mind. And, 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 and so they thought that. So here's the thing. Let me spin this spiritually for you. If we don't partake of Jesus, in other words, we don't, we don't actively seek him, then we can't be sustained in life. It's just, it goes back to how I open this thing up. If we don't continue with this bread of life, that he's our sustainer, that he is what's in the center of our being, you know, what I'm under, you know what I'm talking about? He's a sinner of your being. And if he is not there, then we are just relying on our own inadequacies. And we will have no joy, no victory. We will have no hope. We will be self-centered, idol-following people. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last days. Because my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. You see, here's the thing. If we don't actively seek Jesus, what we do in life will die. There's no purpose. Just like the blood that flows through us. If we, you know, what happens when blood stops flowing through the veins to the extremities? They die. And, and, and so, if Jesus isn't a part of us, if, if we're not actively seeking him, then all of a sudden what happens is, is anything that we try to do or produce in life eventually is going to die. Now, I know that there's people who don't seek Jesus, and they're very successful. How many know those people? You know they don't seek Jesus, but they're very successful. You say, Pastor, that goes against that. I'm telling you, at some point, that is going to die. It is not like, I mean, the Bible says, do not go after treasures that rust and moth can destroy, but go after what is eternal. And, and so he's saying, look, you've got to do this. You don't understand. Oh. Then he goes on and says this. I will raise him up on the last day. We talked about that. In the age to come. By the way, now. The age to come is now. The age to come is when we accept him and we're following him. He's the center of our being. We are living in the age to come. Our eternity has started. Something that we don't have to wait for. And he will raise us up. In other words, we were dead to our sins, but now we have been resurrected in newness of life. We get so caught up in the tomorrow I'll be taken out. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm not willing to waste my time here worried about something that hasn't happened because my eternity is now, not tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you this right now. That anything you try to substitute for Jesus is fake and false. He is the real food. He is the real drink. He is the real deal. Amen. Then he says, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, listen to this, lives in me, Jesus says, and I in him. I don't think you know how powerful that is now, y'all. I'm talking about if I am pursuing him as he pursues me. You see, if I get... Oh, how am I going to put this? If I allow the spiritual working deep within me that Jesus is trying to teach me, if I get him to affect my physical outward stuff, then he is in me, and I am in him, and nothing can stand in my way of living a victorious life. Because it's not me living now, is it? He is in me. That means when the storms of life come, I don't have to paddle, because he stands up in the boat and says, peace be still. When I'm hungry on the hillside, I don't have to search because he said, I will provide your every need. 
But see, we can get wrapped up spiritually here, just in the one dimension, correct? And say, I don't have to work. And I don't have to worry about, you know, I don't have to do anything. When, when something happens to me, I just, well, whatever. We get locked up on that. Jesus got it. He does have it. But this is where it's important that you understand what I'm saying. Is that if that spiritual side doesn't affect my physical side. So in other words, when the storm of life, it starts taking place. And I say, you know what? I don't have to row against the storm anymore. Right? But you know what I choose to do? I choose to get out of the boat and walk above my storm. That's what it's about. See, the spiritual understanding of I don't have to row anymore is now transferred and made me physically change. I'm going to walk above the storm because Jesus is in me. The same way with the food. When I'm hungry, whether it's spiritual hunger or physical hunger, you know, yeah, I don't have to. God's promised me to provide my needs, right? But all of a sudden I say, you know what? I understand that God has provided my need and he has given me ability to step out of the situation and get a job and eat. Do something. Or to open my Bible and study the bread of the Word of God. See, the spiritual now is driving me to a physical understanding of me opening the Word and digging deep and setting aside time and sacrificing time so I'm in the Word. Now all of a sudden, I've got the physical transforming in my life because of what the spiritual is doing. You understand that? We're on the same page here? He says in 57, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds me, or feeds on me, will live. So he goes, just as real as the Father is, this is real as well. And it's because of me, because of what he's going to do. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like manna. Your fathers ate, and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. And he said this in a synagogue, so the teaching is going, but ah! the people are going nuts, right? Because they're not getting it. He said, you don't understand. You're going to live. You're going to have this because of what I'm going to do. I am going to the cross. There's many people out there that said, well, Jesus really didn't know God's plan until, because he says in there that no one knows the time or hour and this and that. But I, I think Jesus knew. Because, I mean, he's saying, look, you don't get it. I am. What's going to take place in a little while? You're going to live. And it's because of me. It's because the Father sent me. And if you believe, and you understand, and you seek after me, and you allow the spiritual to change, your, or the physical, you allow your physical to be changed by the spiritual, then all of a sudden, listen, you are going to live forever. And I don't necessarily think, listen to this, that always means live for eternity. I'm talking living life now. I don't know about you, but I love life. I like the things, I'm going to be honest with you, I like the things of this world. Not like the bad thing. I'm talking like God's creation. You go outside. I know some of y'all don't like snow, but I can't wait for like the first really good snow. Because man, it takes the dirt and grime of winter and it makes it brand new. Now after that, you go away and you go on to the rest of it. I'm fine with that. I even like the ice that sticks to the trees. and makes everything crystallized. Because I look at it and I say, look, God has already taken his creation and he's making it like emeralds and he's making it like diamonds. And I see God just resurrecting his whole world and setting things right. I love oceans. I love these physical things. Man, I love relationships. I like to get to know new people. I like to hear their story. Life is good. I even kind of like some of the electronics man has come up with. <laughs> but the question I have for you is the same question. So let's go on. We're going to finish six, believe it or not. So in, in, in verse 60, okay, in verse 60, this was the response of the people. Therefore, many of his disciples heard this and they said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? I find it interesting because in the complete Jewish Bible it says, And his Talmudim heard this and they said, 
This is a this is a hard teaching. Who can even listen to it? You see, when we get stuck in one dimensional living, and someone tells us that we need to combine these two, we don't want to do it. Because that means God is requiring me, okay, I guess I use the word require, me to change the way I treat people, the way I even live my life. Because I am a follower of Yeshua, my Messiah. Oh, that's a hard teaching. That means he may want me to actually give up some of my money and tithe. Yes, he does. Not because he needs your filthy money. But you need to give it to him out of faith. He may say to you, you need to give up some of your time and work in the nursery. Now, I saved this announcement till this point in the sermon. <laughs> you thought I forgot, but I knew where I was going to put this thing. I'm going to give you a little math problem. Okay? We had so many nursery workers, and we lost five. And we gained one. Equals X. We're down four. Dan Wright, I'm, I'm pointing him out because I can't. Is he even here? Oh, good. I won't get in trouble. He volunteered. Guys, we need men in that nursery, too. But here's the thing. We don't, and I know I might be stepping on some toes, but you'll get over it. We need people to give up their time for the benefit of our children. So that mom and dad can come in here and get the word of God so they don't go home and kill their children or we won't have any children left. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, oh, no, no, no. I'm not gifted in that. Really. If you're a parent, you have been gifted. If you're a grandparent, you was gifted. You can be gifted again. Do you see what I'm saying, though? We're so wrapped up in me, myself. We're so wrapped up here that we're not allowing God to call us into things. We're not allowing God to say, let the spiritual teaching I'm trying to teach you in the Word of God transform your life so that you can walk in a different way. So when the people of this world that God has given you see you, they say, what is different about that person? I want what he wants. You know what? With all the tragedy in the world, I see moping and heads down. And here's the thing. We, if we do this, we can't look up ministry opportunities to say, wait a minute, there is still hope in this world. His name is Jesus Christ. He's not old-fashioned. He's very modern. He's very relevant. And he wants to radically change your life. <laughs> but what's the hard teaching in that? Is that mean the church has got to clean up their business? Quit acting like a hypocrite. Quit hating one another. Stand up for what is right. Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Go to the one who is lost and find the one who needs Jesus. Be the good Samaritan that didn't care about the political ramifications of them stopping and helping and touching somebody. When will the church get it together so people will not say, I don't want to be like them? Have we got stuck in the one dimensional living? Jesus, knowing himself, in himself, that his disciples were complaining about this, asked him, does this offend you? And I asked the same question. The complete Jewish Bible says, is this a trap for you? Are you, are you trapped in your religiousness that you can't get out of that bubble? Later on in that passage, Jesus says, do you want to leave me? He looks at the twelve, because so many people left him. Now, a lot of people said everybody left him but the twelve, but I don't think that's right. I think that just the, some left because it was a hard teaching. And then there was the people and then the twelve. And he looked at the twelve who were, and he goes, you want to leave too? Are you offended by what I've said to you? 
I guess that's my question. You know I don't lack boldness. Well, you think I don't lack boldness, because actually, really, I do. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, I could say that. I think I'd say it. The church, we're not cleaning up our business. we got to be followers of Yeshua. we gotta, we got we to quit. We have to be willing to allow Jesus to wreck our worldview. We have to let Jesus wreck our political understanding. And we have to allow Jesus to come in and radically change our lives physically through what he's trying to do spiritually. You see, Jesus wasn't teaching about cannibalism and he wasn't doing any of this thing. You know, it is my prayer, my hope that we have the same reaction that Peter did. And that the, that the 12, and, and you've got to understand, remember, you got, you got Jesus, the youth pastor. Most of his disciples, his 12, were teenagers. And he had one youth uh, adult sponsor by the name of Peter. And so I believe Peter is speaking for the 12. Because see, when Jesus went off to pray, and when Jesus went and did his thing, it was Peter that was in charge. We don't give Peter enough credit. You ever been a youth pastor? I have. I've also been a youth sponsor, and then when the youth pastor leaves and you're left with it, woo, it's like a substitute teacher all over again. But listen to how he responds. And it is my prayer that we as a body of Christ respond the same way. Peter looks at him and says, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Another translation that you have the words that brings about the age to come. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. You are the Messiah, the Anointed One. You see, I hope and I pray. I mean, I, I, I hope and I pray that that's our response. When, when, when Jesus comes and he says, look, this is what I've called you to do. This is what I've done. When, 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 when you understand this, the two-dimensional understanding of saying, okay, this is what God's teaching me from a spiritual standpoint, and how is this going to affect my life? And you know what? I'm going to understand it, and instead of saying this is a hard teaching and being offended, I'm going to apply the spiritual teaching to this part of my life. And I'm going to walk in freedom and restoration. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to allow the spiritual to work in me in such a way that, that I can walk it out physically in, in the human understanding. And I hope that you can say, where will we go? Because nothing else makes sense. I've tried the selfish way. I've tried culture's way. I've tried the, the relative way. I've tried all these things, and, and I've tried it, and, and, and it fails every time. Where else am I going to know? You're the only one that brings new exodus in my life. You're the only one that brings resurrection and new creation in my life. It is only you that I can understand. Where else am I going to go? For we believe Jesus that you are Messiah, not just the Messiah of the Bible, but Messiah of today, that one day you are coming back and you are going to bring everything back to rights. You are going to set up your throne and you are going to rule with a just and loving and gracious and mighty hand and we are going to find out what it can be like when people follow you. Amen. What is our response going to be? And Jesus then says, and if you read that passage, I'm not reading it word for word, but if you read that passage, Jesus says, I'm not only telling you this, but I'm living it out. And he says, look, I'm the one who chose you. I called you, even though I called the 12, and one of you in this 12 is going to betray me. 
but I called you to my side, and I used you, and I work with you, and I love you, and I show you mercy. Jesus allowed a betrayer, we would call him an enemy, in, and he loved and cared for him. So he says, I'm not just talking the talk, I'm walking it as well. I'm not just giving you something spiritual, I'm, I'm showing you it in the physical. This, uh, I've got some guys that I text and, and, I, and I give them some things to be thankful for every day. If I try to do it every day, it's not every day. Um, but when I, I can't even remember what the question was. But it was about, uh, maybe it was about a heart thing to be thankful for. I, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. But one of my answers were, and I said, this is kind of off the wall, but I'm thankful for Judas. Man, he had to walk it out. He got the ball rolling because Jesus go to the cross so Jesus can go and put his sins on, on the cross so he can say it is finished so he can go to the grave so he can come out three days later and prove who he was. I can call Jesus my friend, my brother, because of what happened. That's a hard thing to understand, guys. Okay? But man, you read and you understand what Jesus went through after the fact. The torment emotionally for what he did. There was repentance and there was sorrow in his heart. So how are we going to respond? How are we going to respond? Jason, you come forward. Brandon, you take it on the table. A lot of people look at this and they understand that Jesus was also pointing to communion. <laughs> And he was. He was pointing to the fact that here is here is something that we do physically by taking up communion to remember what happened physically, but also to remember what happened spiritually. And Paul and, and some of the other New Testament writers, man, they were very, you know, when we take communion, this doesn't give us salvation. This is just a remembrance. This is just us doing something physical to remember what Jesus has done spiritually in our lives. But if you don't take this for the way it is, if you think this is just something that the church does, it's just a, a ritual, you miss out. The, you miss it. You miss the fact that when we take that bread and we drink the juice, that, that we're saying, you know what, God, I want to seek after you. I want you to be the center of my being. I want you to be my sustainer. I want your relationship to flow through all my veins so that I can reach and touch with Jesus and that my life has meaning and purpose and what I touch lives and not dies. This is why this is important. This is why we, the Bible says if you do this and you have awe with your brother, you're coming in the wrong spirit. And, and, and you can't remember the good that this means when you've got hatred and stuff in your heart. So he says, don't do it. Matter of fact, Paul writes that, that it's a curse upon you if you do it with that attitude. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, if you have a relationship that, that's off, you got to fix it. And we have this bread here in the center of this loaf. And this is just... For you, if you're in that situation, to come and break a piece and go to somebody in the room and say, look, i got an issue, we got to fix this, we need to make it right, so that you can have communion and come back and experience the joy of what Jesus did, what Jesus did for us. It's also the reason why I say, if you're not a believer in Jesus, don't do it, because you're missing the point. And then it's just a ritual. And rituals without faith in his Jesus as the sinner will die. And it means nothing. So today as we come, you see, it comes down to this. Remember?
remember the story I gave you at the beginning about David and pouring out the blood? And David said, this is like drinking the blood of those who've gone and put their life down. Jesus kind of was saying the same thing in the scripture, only he was saying, I want you to drink of what I have done for you physically so that you can have resurrection, not only physically, but also spiritually. He says, I want you to take it. I want you to take it. You know, David wouldn't because it was a disrespect to those men. But Jesus says, take it from me and live. Lord leads you.